Let me show all of you something that Stephanie Grisham used to describe just how porous the um, border, if you will, to the White House residents and West Wing really were during those weeks. There were meetings taking place up there. Uh, I, I don't have visibility into what was discussed in all of the people who were there, but I can say um, that, you know, Mark Meadows would have been there as well as the legal team that was working on um, all of the bonkers little plans. The former president did that often. He did that quite a bit because there was a lot of paranoia about leaks in the White House, and so he would just have people up to the residence. So, Betsy, I saw that differently after reading Mike's reporting, that um, we all know that there were the wackiest and the most sort of fringy folks, people like Mike Flynn, who had the president's ear by this point and the, the pillow person and somebody else from Overstock. But what was interesting was being reminded of Donald Trump's extreme paranoia and the steps he took to avoid things like logs and sort of the, the normal structural things about a White House, phone logs. We know Mike's reported that he was picking up all sorts of different phones, visitor logs. You've got Stephanie talking about meetings in the residence. Talk about the importance of getting into the hands of the committee anything that is on paper, committed on paper in black and white. Yeah, it's important because when you have documents detailing the fact that these meetings were arranged or the substance of what they talked about, it makes it a lot harder for witnesses who go in to be deposed by the committee to act like they don't remember things. We know that that's a standard tactic that people in Trump world took for the entirety of his administration when it came to any of the vast number of scandals that percolated, saying they didn't recall certain meetings or phone calls or conversations. And that's why these written records are so vital. It's also why this investigation is uniquely challenging for a congressional investigative body, which just doesn't have the same resources and the same awesome power that the Justice Department has. It's challenging because these records are incredibly decentralized. They're all over the place. In the case, of course, of some of the written records that, that were sent to Mar-a-Lago, for a while they weren't even in the possession of the National Archives or of the U.S. government. They've very much been sort of spread to the fore wins and bringing all these documents or even the bulk or even most of these documents back together in one place to try to, to try to make sense of them is something that's really time consuming and labor intensive. And that's part of the reason that the letter from the White House counsel's office this morning is so consequential, because as Mike said, what, what the National Archives is being urged to do is to move expeditiously. Clearly, the Biden administration understands that the clock is really ticking when it comes to the amount of time the select committee has to figure out the totality of what happened on and before January 6th. Yeah, I mean, Tim, the other thing that strikes me, and you've spent time interviewing Congressman Kinzinger, and I think you and I are both familiar with Liz Cheney and the Democrats on the committee have been pretty upfront about this, is not only is the clock ticking, but they have a massive production ahead of them, and those are those public hearings. I want to read what um, NBC News is reporting about what those will look like. The January 6th panel looks to design hearings for a public that's heard a lot about Trump. Members of the committee envision hearings that they hope will prove too riveting to ignore. They're banking on wall-to-wall -wall coverage on cable news, headlines on news sites, and a constant churn on social media. They're preparing to tell a story with a beginning, middle, and end, stretched out over two to three weeks, complete with surprises and plot twists. Viewers will see live witnesses and video presentations suited to an audience that has not breathlessly followed every detail of the January 6th saga, according to members. You and I have talked about this gap between um, shows like this one, where we cover every development, <clears throat> the big ones and the not so big ones, and this public that is not necessarily paying attention to every move of the 1-6 committee. The committee seems aware of that dynamic as well. Oh, no doubt. I mean, and, and this is where they, they face a little bit of a challenge. We talked about this a little bit on the show, but it's, it's worth re revisiting. It's just so much of this happened out in the open. Right. And, and, and so there's so much of this of, of people as, as consumers. And I, I'm not endorsing this view. I don't agree with this view. But a lot of times as consumers are like, ah, I'm sick of this. Right. I'm ready to move on. I get it. I, I think I get it. I think I know what happened. You know, I have other issues, other concerns. What's happened in my local school or inflation or whatever. I'm ready to move on. And so so the committee's aware of this challenge. And I've heard from members of the committee. I've talked to about this. And they know that they need to present a really compelling 
vision about what happened or tell a really compelling story about what happened in the in the weeks leading up to January 6th and on January 6th itself. And the thing that they have going for them is that there still are unknown things about, uh, that, that are at the highest moments of that drama, right? Which is what was the president doing as the Capitol is getting stormed? We don't really know. Was the president standing in the way of efforts to get the National Guard and other resources there to protect the Capitol? We don't really know. This is where the visitor logs come in. So here's just one example. At the Bulwark we, last January, we broke the story that Michael Mike Lindell, the pillow, pillow person, as you called him, t- telling the president that the, the, he should declare martial law inside the Oval Office. How did we break that? Not because we have any great scoops like, like Michael and, uh, and Betsy. We broke it because we were watching Mike Lindell brag about it on his Instagram, right? Like he's got, <laughs> uh, you know, these are not the smartest criminals in the world, right? Uh, but the point being that there could have been, that there are other examples of things like this that we don't know, right, about who, who exactly was in those conversations, what exactly they were advocating for. And I think that the committee, you know, by, by pulling this all together, as Betsy said, is going to be able to to hopefully paint a dramatic picture that can get people's attention who, who have kind of moved on to other stuff, um, because it's, it's too important to ignore. Well, that's a great point. And we do know so much about some of the crazy people who were in the Oval Office. And, and I guess, Mike Schmidt, what are they looking for? I mean, we know Mike Flynn was there. Your colleague Maggie Haberman tweeted about it. We know the pillow guy was there. Tim said he posted it on Instagram. Who are they looking for that they don't already know about? Well, I think the committee is trying to come up with the most evidentiary based account of what happens in the months, weeks, days, minutes leading up to January 6th and during it. But what I've often wondered about these White House documents and about Trump in general is that at the end of the day, how helpful will they be? And here's why. What we've seen in the past few weeks are disclosures about how the president didn't follow the Presidential Records Act and other Federal Records Act things that have made it harder for investigators to figure out what he was doing. On top of that, this was a White House that didn't function at all like a normal White House. If you can imagine the Obama White House, Obama's time was mapped down to the minute. You know, if you wanted to meet with him, you had to book it, you know, months or weeks in advance and such. And the Trump White House was run in such an ad hoc way, an abnormal way, that in some ways, you know, you know, old Washington hands would say, oh, wow, this is great. Such a trove. We can see into what the schedules were and the logs were of this White House. But that assumes that they were following the rules and the laws. And that assumes that that people were actually being badged in or waved in or brought in as visitors in appropriate ways. And someone wasn't just opening the door and telling Mike Flynn and his friends to just come right on in so they could run up to the residence. So I think it remains to be seen how helpful these documents are. And Trump could be helped by the fact that they just didn't follow the basic norms and laws of the Presidential Records Act when they were in office. I mean, that said, Betsy, they didn't communicate in Morse code. I mean, they did use cell phones. And your colleague Kyle Cheney has some reporting about what they're looking for in the phone records category. Um, The January 6th panel seeks phone records of security official employed by Alex Jones. The January 6th Select Committee has issued a subpoena for the phone records of a security guard for pro-Trump broadcaster Alex Jones, a sign of the panel's deepening interest in Jones' contacts related to his involvement in Donald Trump's January 6th rally, which preceded the violent attack on the Capitol. In a court filing late Tuesday, Jones revealed that Timothy Enloe, that was his security guard, was notified by AT&T on February 9th that the select committee had subpoenaed his phone records. Enloe, who has worked for Jones since 2018, accompanied Jones in Washington on the 6th when Jones marched from the ellipse, where Trump held a rally calling for the election results not to be certified from the ellipse to the Capitol he marched, protected by Mr. Enlow. What are they looking for? That's a good question. And they haven't detailed in in these court filings the specifics of what they're investigating. But the fact that they're, that they're looking at a security guard to Alex Jones tells us that they're interested not just in Jones, but in the group of people around him. We also know the committee is leaning really hard on phone companies to provide phone records from a 
vastly wide variety of people who had visibility into what happened on January 6th. We also learned this morning that Laura Cox, who was subpoenaed by the select committee just yesterday, she was the former head of the Michigan Republican Party who was sitting next to Rudy Giuliani when he made some incredibly incendiary comments about election fraud. Laura Cox said in a statement that she provided to us that the January 6th Select Committee has also sought out her phone records in connection to the work that it's doing. Cox is certainly someone who's not a household name, even in the wake of having been subpoenaed by the Select Committee. The fact that they're going after her phone records and going after the records of a whole number of other people who are also connected to this shows that they're drawing webs between who is talking to who, what calls were happening, how, how, how long was the duration of these calls. They're trying to find the connections between people people who had visibility prior to January 6th into the efforts that Trump and his and his allies were rolling out as it involved trying to reverse the election results. And that's what these kind of phone records really show you. Our understanding is that they're not scooping up the contents of text messages or voicemails, but rather what they're looking at is the metadata, the connections between different people who are having these phone calls. And that in and of itself can be really revelatory.